In regard to scripture repetition, think of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, right? By and large, especially the first three, they tell the exact same story three different times from three different perspectives. Some of them are very similar. Some of them vary a little bit in, in people and places. But by and large, it's the same story. John's a little bit different. He deals with some different topics because he had a goal with his gospel, and that was to teach men how to be saved. But he still refers to a lot of Matthew, Mark, and Luke's content in a repetitious manner. Also, think of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. These chronicle the times of the kings of Israel and give us the same events in different perspectives. You'll find things that are a little bit different. Some will call them contradictions, but they're simply the case where God, yes, hath approved and ordained and sanctified his word so that it is 100% true. They're just different perspectives. So the untrained and unspirit-filled mind may look, oh, there's a contradiction between chronicles and kings, therefore it's not the word of God. But if you study these things out, God will always, you know, show you with great excitement that it's the same thing. Whether it's this king started his reign at age 25, and another account says at age 40. You'll find as you study it out, it's just a matter of perspective. Oh, he started as a king at 25, and he was made king again at 40. And if you just looked at the two things separately and said, look at this, you might think there's a contradiction. There's never a contradiction in the Word of God. Amen. But we do see repetition in Scripture. God giving Amen. us the same events repeated from a different perspective. Even think of Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, specifically Exodus to Numbers, are repeated almost entirely in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is known as the second law. The, the duplicate law where basically Moses, the same author, gives us everything he had previously noted and written and penned down under the inspiration of God in a concise book of Deuteronomy. So he takes Exodus and puts it there. Leviticus puts it there. Numbers puts it there. Repeating it from this a different perspective or even for a different audience. Now, sometimes I believe God repeats things to help us. He gives us a repeated story for clarity. Different, uh, different authors with different perspectives see things a little bit differently and record it as such. Clarity comes when you compare them. Also, you'll have clarity, you'll have different insights and perspectives, which do help us as readers. Sometimes we can identify maybe a little bit more with Luke than we can with Matthew, just in how he presents the words. And so that differing perspective helps us to kind of see things in a different light, and then we understand more as a result. Also, I believe God gives us things in many different uh, repetitious perspectives because he needs to fulfill, the, the essentially, his requirement for verification of truth inwardly of the scriptures. What do I mean by that? Well, the Bible says that at the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Our courts of law today will not accept the testimony of one to contemn a man. In other words, I can't walk in and say, I caught Brother Jamie doing such and such. They will say, do you have any more witnesses? If I don't, it's thrown out. Because I could just have a bias against him, and I could just be kind of claiming whatever I want. There's no way of verifying my story. But if there's another witness that says, yes, I agree to that, but what I saw was this. Maybe I thought he was in a white shirt, and he thought he was in a blue shirt. They will still put those testimonies together, and they're valid because they tell the same events of what happened, even though a detail like a different color of shirt is there. In fact, actually, a small detail like that gives actually more credence to the truth of it. It guarantees that if I have a different idea of what he was wearing than the second witness, and even a third witness, it guarantees that I didn't collaborate with him in going to condemn him for the crime. A little bit of variety in a truthful um, witness gives more own it, gives more credence to it. It makes it more valid. Amen. And that's what our court of law agrees with too. And God says the same thing. At two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And I believe God even put that into his own word to verify to us that he's telling the truth. When he had this man and that man and this man. Or this man at this year in time, and that the same man at this year in time say the same events with a little bit different of a perspective. 
Sometimes, again, these different witnesses come from different people. Sometimes it's the same person as in the case of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. It's the same person, but he's, he's 40 years apart giving those events in a different fashion. That also gives credence to the fact that it's true because he's rehashing the same events, but he's not just copying and pasting these. He's 40 years later and wiser giving his, his, his uh, idea of what happened at that time. So as is the case in those examples, God giving us two or three witnesses to allow his word to be established, I believe such is the case when we got into Revelation 12 and so on. Revelation 12 even has three internal witnesses. I don't know if I pointed that out well enough. You can go to Revelation 12. <clears throat> but if you look in Revelation 12 and in verse 4, you're going to find that essentially God compartmentalized the same event into three different accounts. I'll show you what I mean. Revelation 12 and verse 4 it says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Notice, cast them down. Now look at verse 9, it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with them. Now look at verse 13, it says, And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. What we're seeing here is not three casting outs, but one event told in three different ways, three different perspectives. In the same chapter, God is giving us three different perspectives, interpretations, uh, records of the same event and how it came. So we can take those three separate things and put them together to maybe get a better understanding of what actually went on in that event. Three retellings of the same. So I would encourage you as a good Bible study principle based on the inward truth of what God gives us, that statement, the mouth of two or three witnesses, shall every word be established. If you are studying a Bible principle or a doctrine, if you have two or three witnesses, you can start to feel comfortable that you are on to something in regard to making a doctrine. But if you only have one witness to a truth, be leery. You might have just stumbled onto something that is like an outlier that means something else, but if you single that out, you're going to become a cult. Two or three witnesses, you make a doctrine. One witness in scripture, you become a cult if you run with that as a key doctrine. What do I mean? Matthew 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I can just take that out and I can become the church of Christ. Right? Because they believe that you've got to believe and be baptized in order to be saved. Right? But if I was to look at the whole of Scripture, I would see constantly, it's just believe, 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 believe. Even the second part of that same verse, it says that, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Right? So it's the belief that gets somebody saved, not the baptism, though it pairs them up. But if I go and dishonestly just take that out, I can make a doctrine out of it. I can become a cult. But the scriptural truth is that I cannot find two or three witnesses of that same statement anywhere in the Bible where I could actually say, okay, there's something here about believing and being baptized. That might be a truth in scriptures. No, this is a one-time event. So don't take the testimony of that one witness, that one verse in the scriptures, and accept it as truth until you compare it with the plethora of other ones. And if you do, you'll find that, of course, it's believe only, not believe and be baptized. That was just an example. Look for two witnesses at least. Three is better. But for something like faith alone and Christ alone, there's hundreds just in the book of John, right? So then we automatically know when we have so many witnesses that it's believe only, that if there is one verse that says that, we know that that one verse isn't saying what at first glance we might think it is. It's not saying believe and be baptized. Why? Because there's hundreds of verses that say believe only. I must be interpreting that incorrectly. You go to that verse, you dig around it in the context, you say, oh, okay, that's still saying believe only. It's just written from Mark's perspective, inspired by the Word of God in a way that seems confusing to me.